So in the last video, I talked about the Kronig penny model, and we said that the final result of the Kronig penny model was this thing called an energy momentum diagram, or an EK diagram. And I said it looks something like this. So we've got these two sort of continuous curves, uh, on, one on the top and one on the bottom. And these curves, this, this is a, the result of solving the Schrodinger equation. So it basically says, for what values of momentum and for what values of energy is there a quantum state or where are the electrons allowed to be? And this might seem kind of weird at first because um, typically energy is just related to momentum by our simple classical mechanics equation. Uh, e is just equal to momentum squared divided by twice the mass. But here that's not the case. Here it seems like there's there's a more restrictive equation and definitely we can't just represent like a, a simple equation like this. And that's a consequence of quantum mechanics. So we don't have these simple classical results to, to rely on anymore because of quantum mechanics. So electrons can only take certain values of momentum or really they can have uh, say any value of mo momentum between zero or minus minus k max and k max. So we're just going to say that these are the maximum and minimum values of momentum that the electron can have, plus minus k max. And once you know the momentum of the electron, say the momentum is here, uh, then you immediately know the energy. The energy must either be there or there. One of those two. It cannot be any other value. And this might seem a little weird, uh, but it's nothing but, it's saying something very similar to our classical equation relating energy momentum. It's saying that once the momentum is fixed, the energy is also fixed. And so there's there's nothing strange about this. You've been interacting with this for, for a long time. Quantum mechanics is just saying, well, yes, uh, but now the equation relating these two is a little more complicated. So we use EK diagrams to understand uh, electron properties. Now, one of the tricks about EK diagrams and one of the things that makes them difficult to interpret is if you rearrange the equation, so let's say let's solve for M, uh, you'd get that M is equal to P squared over 2E. But uh, P squared over 2E isn't equal to a constant. So like you can choose, uh, or since p is h bar squared k, you can say h bar squared k squared over 2e. But here, like if we choose a value of k that's say here, maybe this is a k of 3, um, and the energy is say a value of 2, and I'm explicitly uh, not talking about units here because uh, that introduces unnecessary difficulty. Um, so let's say we have a momentum value for 3 and an energy value of 2, then we just calculate the mass. Well, it's equal to uh, h bar squared times 3 squared, which is 9, divided by 2 times e, which is 2 times 2. So it's just h bar times h bar squared times 9 fourths. Uh, but if we choose a different point, so say the momentum is here, it's at a value of 4, we get about the same energy. So we see that the moment, the mass is actually h bar squared times 16 over 4. And you might say, well, what's, what's going on here? It looks like the mass of the electron has actually changed. And indeed it has. Um, the effective mass of the electron depends on where you are along this curve. So if we want to treat an electron as if it were a... Uh, as if it were just having a single mass, we'd want to do it in a location of this curve that makes sense. So we want to do it in a part of the curve where E looks like h bar squared k squared divided by 2m. Uh, so we want, to, we want to say that, well, the energy is related to the square of the momentum. And we know that anything related to the square of something else is just a just a parabola. That's all it looks like. And so we can say, well, uh, this region kind of looks like a parabola. Like it'll it'll deviate at larger energies, but you know, near the center, so over this range, we get a reasonably constant value for m. And we can say, well, energy and and momentum are approximately 
uh, related by, by this equation. And we can use this parabola, uh, this approximation, to say that the mass has a constant value. So we can solve this equation for the mass, essentially, um, and then we can figure out what the mass, the effective mass of the electron is. And the value in this approach is it actually lets us calculate the effective mass of the electron in both the conduction band, so remember this is up here the conduction band, and the valence band. But you'll notice that in the conduction band, the parabola is facing one direction, so the mass is gonna have a positive value, the mass of the electron is gonna have a positive value. But on the bottom here, the parabola is facing downward, so the mass of the electron is gonna be negative in this region. So in this valence band, when an electron is just sitting here, it's going to act as if it has a negative mass. And you could say, well, that's, that's just bizarre, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, or you could replace that electron with a hole that has a positive mass. So this is why we use holes instead of electrons. We could just use electrons with negative mass uh, because effectively that's what they are. But instead we just talk about holes or positively charged particles that have a certain effective mass. And we can determine the effective mass of both of these particles by the curvature of those parabolas. So if we take this equation and we want to find a, a way, we want to find an expression for the mass involving the curvature of this parabola, or we're trying to fit uh, parabolas to the EK diagram so that within a certain within a certain range we get a reasonably constant value for the mass. And we can do this by just solving for m, uh, but it'll turn out to be easier if we instead just take the derivative. So if we want to find the curvature of this parabola, we know that the curvature is just related to the second derivative, and we can take the second derivative of any function. So we can take the second derivative of these EK curves at a certain point, say at zero, and then that curvature will just give us the mass. So we just take the second, the first derivative with respect to k, and we get uh, two h bar squared k over two m, uh, the twos just cancel. And then we take the second derivative, which gives us the curvature of the parabola, and that's just equal to h bar squared over m. And so this quantity uh, the second derivative of energy with respect to momentum can be evaluated, at least numerically, for any EK diagram. And that's valuable to us because we can't just assume that everything will behave nicely, that everything will be a parabola, that every particle has constant mass. So this allows us to get an approximate value for the mass, or if we, if we want to solve for m, we'll get that m is just h bar squared divided by the second derivative of energy with respect to momentum. And so this lets us basically, uh, it lets us use quantum mechanics and kind of abuse quantum mechanics uh, to say that, well, these particles, uh, they kind of look like they have a certain mass. If we're being precise, uh, the particles don't have a constant defined mass because the energy momentum diagram uh, doesn't doesn't show that the the mass changes with depending on the momentum that you have. But if we approximate the if we approximate these ek curves as parabolas that we fit to the ek diagram, so maybe a more narrow parabola on the bottom and a more uh, rounded parabola, more wide parabola on the top, then we can use this to give us an effective value for the mass. We say that this is m star, and m star is just the effective mass. And so we can get the effective mass for an electron in the conduction band or a hole in the valence band with the same equation in each case. And so this is great because remember when we derived the density of states, when we, uh, when we did a bunch of other stuff, we needed a constant mass for the electron. Uh, and we needed to know the mass of the hole 
that we should use in order for the whole to be approximately treated like an electron. And now we have an expression for that mass. So it's not going to be the same as the mass of the electron. In reality, uh, the effective mass of an electron in silicon is something like 0.82 times the actual mass of the electron. And the, the effective mass of the whole, I think, is a little lighter than that, m effective e. Uh, but we, we have this construct, this approximation, that lets us just, you plug it in basically wherever you see the mass in any equation involving semiconductor physics, and this will give you an approximate answer uh, for the mass, so long as your energy doesn't, doesn't get too big. And so with these EK diagrams, we've managed to use quantum mechanics to give us an expression for how the electrons, both the electrons and the holes, will move in the semiconductor. And ultimately, it's all related to the shape of these energy momentum diagrams. So these are kind of the fundamental result of semiconductor physics. And these, these are things that you can use uh, to great effect with any semiconductor. And they might not be symmetric like this. They might be quite a bit uglier. But so long as you can use, so long as you use these techniques for approximating the mass, you can, doesn't matter what your EK diagram looks like, you can, uh, you can do anything you want with it. And in reality, silicon actually looks a little more messy than this. I've, I've just kind of made it look simpler for, for teaching purposes. Um, and one, one last thing I should say about this EK diagram is typically, uh, so this, first of all, is the band gap energy, EG. This is the energy that it takes an electron to break its bond with the, atom, the, the atoms that it was connecting and become a hole, H plus. So that guy, let's, let's just pretend that, that that guy next to him wasn't, wasn't ever there. So this band gap energy is the amount of energy it takes an electron to jump up into the conduction band. And in doing so, we have one electron we can use to conduct electricity and one hole we can use to conduct electricity. And so usually we flatten these EK diagrams into what are called band diagrams. So we take the momentum coordinate away and we just say, well, the momentum can be whatever we want. Um, we don't really care about it. And we just say that, well, we've got a flat conduction band and a flat valence band. And we've got a bunch of states up here which correspond to different energies and once we know the energy, remember, we know the momentum. So we don't really need this, this graph for everything that we do. And then we've got a bunch of states down here for the holes. Uh, and each hole is going to have a different E, which corresponds to a different momentum. And then within this, so this region, uh, this is the band gap energy, EG. And in silicon, it's approximately 1.12 electron volts depending on your temperature and other things. But there's, so electrons can be in the valence band, in the conduction band, electrons can only conduct electricity in the conduction band, and holes can only conduct electricity in the valence band. And that's, uh, this, these EK diagrams are typically done with the X coordinate or some other spatial coordinate uh, on the X axis and energy is on the y-axis. And we'll use these diagrams in constructing our, uh, our, our equations for the number of electrons and the number of holes, which now we are almost completely ready to do.